continuing in the life of David here. David's service in Saul's court and his exile as a fugitive, these things now become kind of our focus, uh, at least in the next handful of chapters, I think through chapter 21 or so. We're going to find that David, who was once Saul's favorite, would now become Saul's enemy. And that's not by David's doing, that's by Saul's. Now, in these chapters, we see the text really focus in on David's faith and how it endured under the trials that came in his life. So here in chapter 18, we're going to see David deeply trusting in the Lord. Now, to this point, it seems that David's greatest test of faith would have been in our last chapter, chapter 17, where he faced that giant Philistine, Goliath. But we find here, that David's greatest test of faith would actually come while serving in Saul's court. Now, how is his faith tested in this chapter? Well, for one thing, David was beloved by Jonathan, Saul's son. That in and of itself was a test. See, David had been anointed by Samuel, showing that he would be the next king after Saul. However, by right of succession, Jonathan was the one that should have inherited that crown. And the friendship between these two guys who each loved God is a really great example for us. Now certainly there was no jealousy on Jonathan's part because of the honor that had been bestowed upon David. In fact, in our chapter we're going to see that Jonathan uh, gave David his own robe as well as his armor and his weapons. But it wasn't like that with Saul. That's because David had something that Saul was deeply envious of, his popularity with the people. Now in our chapter, the fact that the, the women praise David and, and, David's, and not David's God, that, that's significant. And our, our chapter points out to us how David exercised wisdom. In fact, it will say uh, that phrase behaved wisely a few times here. In regards to the praise of the people, David was wise enough not to put too much stock in their words. Saul, on the other hand, took their words to heart. His heart was filled with envy when he heard uh, that David was receiving a greater praise than he was. Well, Proverbs twenty-seven twenty-one says, The refining pot is for silver and the furnace for gold. And a man is valued by what others say of him. So praise is like, it's like a hot furnace. It reveals what a person is really made of. So it's interesting that the same praise that made David humble only brought to the top, and in regards to Saul, brought the bad things to the top and revealed his pride and his desire for glory. Now, in this chapter, David is also tested by demotion. Verse 5 suggests that David was the head of Saul's personal bodyguard. But then Saul demotes him to being merely the captain over a thousand men. Now, did that change David? No, we'll, we'll find out it didn't change David. His faith was in the Lord. And he continued to serve and to honor his king in his service. And we'll see this a lot of David. Even when persecuted by Saul, he will refuse to speak ill of him or even to raise a hand against Saul, but instead serves faithfully as he is able. Now, several times in our chapter, we're going to see David described as behaving wisely. And it's a Hebrew word, sechal, which means both to understand and also to have success. I think it's kind of interesting that 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 Hebrew word would mean both things, to understand and to have success. That dual meaning is why that particular word is actually used in regards to David here. See, behavior that is based in understanding leads to successful endeavors. And no matter how Saul treated David, or, or the new circumstances that David suffered under because of Saul's envy, David was prudent in his words and actions, and God blessed him for it. 
And David's wise behavior and his success in the face of Saul's increasing persecution of him made Saul all the more afraid. The king knew that God had departed from him and that David had been given those blessings. You know, it takes real faith to experience debasement before the eyes of people and still maintain your humility and service. And finally, David is tested in this chapter by disappointment. I think we've, we've all experienced disappointment in some way or another. And perhaps we thought that God was using us in something uh, and things were going really well and then it was just kind of taken away from us. Or that thing seemed to be such a blessing and, and the, it, was, it was reaping a harvest for the kingdom, but then suddenly it's gone. Do we lose faith in God and then try to, to force things to work in our own efforts, our own way? Well, you know, to quote the elder George Bush, wouldn't be prudent. Not at this juncture. In the previous chapter, Saul had promised one of his daughters to the man who defeated Goliath. You probably remember that. I think it was verse 25 around there of chapter 17. It was David who defeated Goliath. And in this chapter, Saul is going to fulfill his promise to David. But Saul did not keep his word, and the woman was given uh, in marriage to another man. And if that wasn't enough, Saul then uses his daughter uh, Michal as a tool to try to have David killed. But the Lord was with David. And, and David completed the mission successfully, and Saul gave his daughter Michal to David, his wife. Now, it's unfortunate that uh, he did marry Michal because the, the union was never an actually happy one. And we'll discover in chapter 25 that wh even while David was in exile, uh, there was another man that got involved with Michal. But David did gain her back uh, when he started to reign in Hebron. But her attitude toward David led to a complete separation later on, according to 2 Samuel. Now, David was a man of just immense, incredible faith. But he does make some mistakes, as we'll see over the next few weeks in, in our chapters, 19, 20, and 21. Well, 18, 19, 20, and 21. First, he places trust in people. And then we find he places trust in himself. Now, Specifically in regards to our chapter for this evening, chapter 18, David had, in obedience to his father's instructions, he had brought food to his brothers who were uh, fighting with the army facing the Philistines. And when he arrived, he found that a giant named Goliath was mocking Israel and mocking God, and he was getting away with it. There was no one in the whole Israelite army that was willing to face him in a one-on-one -on -one battle to determine who would be the victor. David, however, drew upon his faith in God, and he faced Goliath and defeated him with just a sling and a stone. Now, David was a youth at this point, not even old enough to be in the army. Jewish men had to be at least 20 years old before they could go to war. We find that regulation in Numbers 1-3. From 20 years old and above, all who are able to go to war in Israel, you and Aaron shall number them by their armies. So, you know, David wasn't even at an age where he would, he would be allowed to, to fight. If, if so, he certainly would have been there in the army uh, serving with his other brothers that were there. And it's interesting because, you know, David, he attained a high rank, he attained authority in the Israelite army, and it's likely that David yet was still not of the age that the Bible dictates uh, he was to be to, to fight in, in the wars. Now, David would also repeat that with his own son, Absalom. That's recorded in 2 Samuel 18, where the Hebrew word na'ar means adolescent. Yet verse 5 records that Absalom fought in the army. So for some reason, this was a scriptural regulation but apparently it was considered to have a little bit of wiggle room. Now, in regards to young David, from the beginning of his new assignment, David found himself in a life-threatening conflict with King Saul. But contrary to how Saul saw things, 
David didn't create problems for Saul. David revealed the deep-seated problems that were already there. David was an honest man of faith, but Saul was deceitful. He was scheming. He was a man of the world. With great humility, David had accepted his appointment as Israel's next king, willing to abide in the Lord's timing to ascend to the throne. Meanwhile, Saul was paranoid as he tried to protect his throne, taking credit for the victories of his own son, even at one point willing to to have his own son killed. And now Saul sees threats from David in everything. God had abandoned Saul, but had given his, spirit, his spirit's power to David. And David moved from victory to victory as he led Saul's troops. Now, in this chapter, we see some stages in Saul's growing opposition to David. So let's pray and then verse 1. Lord, we thank you for this evening and this time in your word. And we just ask as we study your word that uh, you would bless your word in our lives, that it would go forth and bring a harvest to your kingdom. Lord, we uh, ask that you would just speak to us, Lord. Perhaps there's... there's issues that you need to deal with us uh, personally this evening that's the case lord and i pray that your word would speak to those areas of our life that need to be dealt with lord we thank you for all assembled here this evening in jesus name amen so verse one says now when he had finished speaking to saul the soul of jonathan was knit to the soul of david and jonathan loved him as his own soul Saul took him that day and would not let him go home to his father's house anymore. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan took off the robe that was on him and gave it to David with his armor, even to his sword and his bow and his belt. There was a time when Saul loved David. Chapter 16 says that Saul loved uh, him greatly. However, Saul's attitude toward David changed first to jealousy, and in our chapter here, we'll really see it change to hate. But the Lord was with David, and Saul was not allowed to hurt him. And even later, when David becomes a fugitive, hiding from Saul, the Lord repeatedly confused Saul's plans and and used his hostility toward David to mold David into an even more courageous man of faith. Now, at this time, Jonathan was probably at least 20 years old, and he was commanding a third of the Israelite army. He had already won two victories. In chapter 13, he defeated the garrison of the Philistines at Giva. And then in chapter 14, he had led his armor bearer in a two-man attack against a whole Philistine garrison, which then led to this great routing of the Philistine army. So Jonathan was a seasoned soldier, and he was a military leader. He was not a child. In fact, Uh, More than one commentary calculates that there would have been an age difference of somewhere between 25 to 28 years between David and Jonathan. Now, in verse 1, we see that Jonathan listened to his father and to David. They were having a conversation. And after that, it says that Jonathan loved David as a dear friend and as a comrade in arms. So Jonathan was Saul's eldest son, and as such, Jonathan was actually destined to the throne of Israel. But the Lord had already given it to David. So their friendship was certainly unique, and perhaps not what we would have expected. Did Jonathan know about David's anointing by Samuel to be the next king? I happen to believe that the answer to that is yes. When, when Jonathan gave his official robe and his armor to David, this recognized him as both a friend and an equal. And I believe that by this, Jonathan was acknowledging that David would one day take his place. So David must have told Jonathan about his anointing. Now the word me'il for robe here, Me'il. It, it denotes a royal robe. Um, you know, the, the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls was hugely, uh, if, if I may quote President Trump, hugely, <laughs> it was hugely important for biblical studies. But also of 
great importance, but much less popularly referenced, are clay tablets that were discovered and deciphered in the 1920s and 1930s that are referred to as the Ugaritic text. Now, they were written in an ancient language of Syria. And these tablets, these texts, they give us a glimpse into the life and the religious worldview of the ancient Israelites. Now, Ugaritic texts, they refer to a special robe that was worn by the crown prince. So if that implication is correct, then Jonathan, in giving his robe to David, was renouncing his claim to the throne. Now, he also gave to him his daily warrior's garments and bow. So the Israelite sword carried in a sheath that hung from the belt. The bow was probably made of uh, animal horn and, and sinews bonded by strips of wood. So Jonathan's gifts to David may very well represent his willingness to give up and transfer uh, his position as, as being the heir apparent to the throne of Israel over to David. So it would be as if a expression of loyalty or possibly even submission to David. Now, to back this up with actual scripture, we find in chapter 20 and then later on also in chapter 23 that David and Jonathan covenanted with one another that when David became king, Jonathan would be second in command. And David uh, covenanted also to protect Jonathan's family from being slain. You know, David and Jonathan, they're, they're one of the great friendships in Scripture. But Saul, Saul was not too happy about his son's friendship with David. For one thing, Jonathan was Saul's best commander. And for another, Jonathan was needed to make the king look good. Saul was afraid that David was too close to the throne in his friendship with Jonathan. And when Saul discovered that David was already anointed to succeed him, of course, that just made matters much worse. Saul saw David as an enemy, a threat to his family holding on to the throne. But Jonathan, on the other hand, he didn't view it that way. You know, when, when a leader nurtures himself on pride, on jealousy, on fear, then he grows paranoid and he begins to suspect everyone. Saul's love for David, influenced by his pride, turned to jealousy and fear. And what Saul desperately needed was humility and repentance. Verse 5. So David went out wherever Saul sent him and behaved wisely. See, there's that phrase. And Saul set him over the men of war, and he was accepted in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. Now it had happened as they were coming home when David was returning from the slaughter of the Philistine that the women had come out of all the cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines, with joy, and with musical instruments. So the women sang as they danced and said, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. So Proverbs 27, 21 says, The refining pot is for silver, the furnace for gold, and a man is valued by what others say of him. In other words, just as the refining pot and the furnace test the metal and prepare that metal for use, so praise tests and prepares people for what God has planned for them. How we respond to praise reveals what we're made of. It reveals whether or not we're ready to take on new responsibilities. If praise humbles us, then God can use us. But if praise causes us to be puffed up, then we ain't ready for promotion. In his attitudes of conduct and service, in his wise behavior, David was a complete success. And we see in verse 7 that Saul's servants and the Jewish people recognized this and they praised him publicly. 
Now, David's popularity, of course, started after his incredible defeat of Goliath. After Goliath fell, the army of Israel chased the Philistines for 10 miles, defeated them, and took their goods. Verses 1 through 5 of our chapter here, they took place immediately after this battle. These verses kind of established the setting uh, of our chapter. Verse 6 then quickly shifts to the turning point of our chapter, which happened as Saul and the army returned from this victory. So as they returned, the women met them and praised both Saul and David, but a little more toward David. Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. Now celebrations usually followed uh, battlefield victory, so this was not unusual. Their, their praise of David demonstrates to us his popularity and, and explains to us why Saul began to, to be envious of him, to, to begin to hate and fear him. Now, the intention of their words was really just to convey large numbers, not to necessarily offer a comparison of one being greater than the other. In fact, it was, a, it was actually a poetic device that would be used, and we see it in the Psalms, such as in Psalm 91.7, where it says, A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. So this was a poetic device. Um, it was used to express large numbers. So then Saul could have been angered simply because David was just mentioned even in this praise, mentioned along with him, kind of placing him at the level of, of himself, of the le- at the level of Saul. Um, either way, you know, the praise was exaggerated, and perhaps Saul understood that, but in one sense it was really true. David's victory over Goliath made it possible for the whole army of Israel to conquer the Philistines. So, you know, in that way, each soldier's uh, triumph or each, each individual soldier's victory was, was a victory for David. And this really riled Saul. Verse 8. Then Saul was very angry, and the saying displeased him. And he said, They have ascribed to David ten thousands, and to me they have ascribed only thousands. Now what more can he have but the kingdom? So Saul eyed David from that day forward. And it happened on the next day that the distressing spirit from God came upon Saul, and he prophesied inside the house. So David played music with his hand, as at other times, but there was a spear in Saul's hand. And Saul cast the spear, for he said, I will pin David to the wall. But David escaped his presence twice. John Flavel, uh, 17th century Presbyterian Puritan and author, he said, it is a dangerous crisis when a proud heart meets with flattering lips. What the women sang didn't seem to affect David, but the song enraged Saul. Now, according to Samuel's prophecy in chapter 15, Saul had already forfeited the kingdom. But we see here that Saul still asked, what can he have more but the kingdom? Saul was seeing Samuel's prophecy beginning to play out before him. And the distressing spirit that had previously come upon Saul once again came upon him. And it says that Saul began to prophesy. In fact, perhaps the prophecy that he was speaking was exactly this question. What can he have more but the kingdom? It's interesting how with with David prefiguring Christ in so many ways, as we talked about last week in chapter 17, It's interesting how Saul responds to David's success. Saul's response to David's success was exactly opposite that of John the Baptist when he was told of the great success of Jesus. Remember John the Baptist, what did he say? He said, he must increase, but I must decrease. So this distressing spirit, which seems to provoke or perhaps to be provoked by envy, has again come upon Saul. 
And so David did what he, what he used to do, and he played music, having a harp in his hand. Saul, however, had a spear in his own hand, perhaps a spear as a symbol of kingship. It would have been the kind of spear not meant for throwing. It would have been a spear with a long shaft meant for thrusting. Yet Saul, overcome with envy, cast the spear at David, and David escaped. And this happened twice. That means that David was willing to risk his life to minister to the very one who wanted to take his life. You know, envy is a dangerous and deceitful enemy. It's, it's a cancer that will just eat out your inner life. And it leads us to do and to say terrible things. Proverbs 14.30 calls it the rottenness of the bones. Envy is it's the pain that we feel within ourselves when somebody achieves or receives what we think belongs to us it's it's a sin of successful people who can't stand to see others reach uh, levels that they have reached or people who might eventually replace them you know by nature we're all proud we want to be recognized we want to be applauded it's as if everybody wears a sign that says please make me feel important we do. We all want to feel important. And so envy motivates a lot of people in a lot of ways. But it's also used to motivate people. You know, a lot of advertising these days thrives on envy. It contrasts the haves and the have-nots. Or urges people who don't have to buy the things that, that they need to keep up with those who do have. You know, and so envious people, what they'll do is they'll, they'll max out their credit cards in order to buy things that they don't need to impress people that uh, really don't care. And of course, then envy also easily leads to anger. Jesus said in Matthew 5 that anger is often the first step toward murder. And this explains why, why Saul threw his spear at David while David was trying to uh, soothe him with music. It's likely that these two attempted murders probably occurred after the victory against Goliath, but before David was made an officer in the army. And yet David remained faithful to the king. In fact, look down to verse 18 and consider what David says to Saul there. Who am I and what is my life or my father's family in Israel that I should be son-in-law to the king? David remained humble. Even humbling himself to the point of placing himself in danger in order to minister to the king. Verse 12 says, Now Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him, but had departed from Saul. So the Lord protected David from Saul's murderous hand, a fact that frightened Saul even more. Instead of picking up that spear and using it against Saul, which David certainly could have done, David relied on the Lord. Saul was outmatched by David by a long shot. He could have had all the spears in the world and yet not harm David because God was with David. Now one would think that surely Saul knew he was fighting a losing battle because the Lord was on David's side but had departed from him. And surely he did, but, but Saul kept up this brave front as he tried to impress others but with his authority. And even if Saul missed his target, the people around him, they got the message. The message was that Saul is king, and he wants David to be killed. So then by all outward appearance, Saul is in control. Saul has the throne, he has the army, he has the spear. Yet Saul was afraid of David 
because the Lord was with him. But it wasn't only that the Lord was with David, it was also that the Lord had departed from Saul. And this made Saul uncomfortable with David. It made it hard for Saul to have David around. And so as we see next, Saul removes David from his presence. Verse 13, Therefore Saul removed him from his presence and made him his captain over a thousand. And he went out and came in before the people. And David behaved wisely, here's that phrase again, in all his ways, and the Lord was with him. Therefore, when Saul saw that he behaved very wisely, he was afraid of him. But all Israel and Judah loved David because he went out and came in before them. Faith could be defined as, as living without scheming. But Saul was better at coming up with schemes than he was at trusting God. When Saul disobeyed God, he always had a lie on his tongue. He had a ready excuse. He had a, uh, some tale to tell to get himself out of trouble. If people challenged his leadership, then he'd figure out ways to eliminate those people. And possessed by anger and, and envy, Determined to hold on to his own crown, Saul decided that David had to be killed. So in the next part of this chapter, Saul tries to arrange David's death in battle. Now it's interesting that sometime later, David would do the same thing to another man in order to steal his wife, Bathsheba. David was a great soldier. He was a born leader. So Saul reasoned that the logical thing was to give him assignments that would take him away from the camp where the enemy could kill him. So Saul demoted David from his royal guard, but made David commander over a thousand and sent him to fight the Philistines. So then, if David was killed in battle, it wasn't Saul's fault. It was the enemy's fault. And if he lost a battle but lived, David's popularity would go down. But the plan didn't work because David won all the battles. The Lord was with him. The power of God was upon him. So it all backfires against Saul. Now, as a commander, David had a continuing series of stunning successes. Instead of eliminating David or diminishing his popularity, all of Saul's scheming only made him a greater hero to the people. And, of course, that increased Saul's fear of David even more. So finally, Saul devised a plot to have David killed by the Philistines, what he considered to be the perfect plan, and he begins to put this plan into action. Verse 17, Then Saul said to David, Here is my older daughter, Mirav. I will give her to you as a wife. Only be valiant for me and fight the Lord's battles. For Saul thought, Let my hand not be against him, but let the hand of the Philistines be against him. So David said to Saul, Who am I? And what is my life or my father's family in Israel that I should be son-in-law to the king? But it happened at the time when Merav, Saul's daughter, should have been given to David, that she was given to Adriel, the, Mah Mah the Maholathite, as a wife. Now, Michal, Saul's daughter, loved David. And they thought Saul, uh, and, they, and they told Saul, and the thing pleased him. He could continue with his plan, in other words. So Saul said, I will give her to him that she may be a snare to him and that the hand of the Philistines may be against him. What a great father. <laughs> Therefore Saul said to David a second time, you shall be my son-in-law today. And Saul commanded his servants Communicate with David secretly and say, Look, the king has delight in you, and all his servants love you. Now, therefore, become the king's son-in-law. So Saul's servant spoke those words in the hearing of David, and David said, Does it seem to you a light thing to be a king's son-in-law, seeing I am a poor and lightly esteemed man? And the servants of Saul told him, saying, In this manner David spoke. Then Saul said, Thus you shall say to David, The king does not desire any dowry, but 100 foreskins of the Philistines. 
Again, a great father. To take vengeance on the king's enemies. But Saul thought to, to make David fall by the hand of the Philistines. So when his servants told David these words, it pleased David well to become the king's son-in-law. Now the days had not expired. Therefore David arose and went, and he and his men, and killed 200 men of the Philistines. And David brought their foreskins, and they gave them in full count to the king, that he might become the king's son-in-law. Then Saul gave him Michal, his daughter, as a wife. All right, so Saul had promised to give one of his daughters in marriage to the man who killed Goliath. That was back in verse 25 of chapter 17. But that promise had not yet been fulfilled. So now Saul speaks to David in regards to his eldest daughter, Merav. Marrying the eldest daughter of the king would give David the title of king's son-in-law, and this would raise his status immensely. In fact, this could have been a potential stepping stone to the throne, especially if David and Jonathan had made the covenant that we spoke of before. So David could have assumed this was the manner by which God wanted to put him on the throne. But David instead chose humility, and in verse 18, he recognized that his family did not have the same social status as Saul and that he could not accept. So Saul chose to be persistent because he wants his scheme to work. Saul would have been anxious to, uh, to command the loyalty and the support of David because he was such a, a great warrior, especially if Saul could do like he did with Jonathan and start taking credit for his successors. But even more than that, Saul wanted to eliminate David. and This was all part of his scheming. So Saul approached this as if it were a gesture of kindness and a gesture of goodness on his part. David was supposed to believe that, well, Saul has forgiven him. He's let bygones be bygones. Yeah, he threw two spears at me, but all that's over now. But Saul was thinking that, he wasn't thinking that way at all. In his heart, he had a very different motive. David, or Saul wants David to fight the battles of the Lord in order to gain his wife, Saul's oldest daughter, Merav. But his plan is to put David in battle at such bad odds that there is no way that he could escape being killed. So we see that Saul wasn't beneath using his own daughter as a tool to get rid of David. Now, the details aren't really given, but the text seems to indicate that David had to fight a certain number of battles before the marriage could take place. Saul was hoping that David would be slain during one of those battles. Then Saul would lose uh, his enemy, but he'd still have his daughter. But David declined in humility. He declined the offer, saying that his family wasn't worthy to be related to the king. So then Saul gave Mirov to another man. But then Saul happily discovered that his younger daughter, Michal, was in love with David. And so David spoke to and so Saul spoke to David about it and, and said that he would give him a second chance to claim his reward. And once again, David refused. But Saul persisted. And this time he asked his servants, to lie to David and to tell David that Saul liked him and wanted him to marry Michal. But David put them off by telling the truth. He was from a lowly family, and he didn't have the money to pay the bride price. Now, the bride price was a sum of money that would be paid by the husband to the girl's parents. Now, typically, it provided for the wife ahead of time in case something happened to the husband, whether he deserted her or he died. Now, of course, this provision would not have been necessary for someone in the royal household, but the amount of the bride price would have reflected the status of the bride. So then David would not have had the means to enter into a royal marriage. However, the price was set by the father. And so Saul attached 
the bride price to the military ability of David rather than to the financial resources that David had. So when David's reply was reported to Saul, he saw this great opportunity to attack his enemies and get rid of David at the same time. Saul told his servants to tell David that all the king required for a bride price was the foreskins from the uncircumcised Philistines. So Saul was certain that at some point in this endeavor, David would meet his death. But David and his men accomplished even more than Saul had asked. And David once more survived the battles, and he brought the king the trophies that he asked for. Saul then had to give uh, Michal to David as his wife, and David became Saul's son-in-law. Verse 28, Thus Saul saw and knew that the Lord was with David, and that Michal, Saul's daughter, loved him. And Saul was still more afraid of David. So Saul became David's enemy continually. Then the princes of the Philistines went out to war. And so it was, whenever they went out, that David behaved more wisely than all the servants of Saul, so that his name became highly esteemed. So by now, Saul was so controlled by emotions that he was obsessed with this desire to kill his new son-in-law. David never considered Saul to be his enemy. And David would never lay a hand on the Lord's anointed. But Saul considered himself an enemy of David. And he remained David's enemy until the day that he died on the battlefield. Saul was making himself the enemy. By making himself the enemy of David, he was making himself the enemy of the Lord. But it didn't have to be like this. Saul's heart, however, was set on this destructive course. And David continued to fight the Lord's battles, and the Lord continued to give him huge successes and, and to magnify his name above the names of Saul and Saul's best officers. And Saul wanted to make David a marked man, and he succeeded. The Philistines went to war against David. David, at this point, he had a lot to fear. But David was walking in the Spirit. He was walking with the Lord. And the Lord kept him safe from both the attack, uh, the, the right up front attack, you know, like the, the enemies, like the Philistines would do. He also kept, kept him safe from the, uh, the kind of stab you in the back enemies like Saul. David paid close attention to what God was doing in him and for him. And we know this because of his psalms. We, we know that the remembrance of these events encouraged him during the difficult days that David would spend in exile. And let's not forget what Paul writes to us of God's faithfulness. In Romans 8, 31 through 39, it says, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for all of us, for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to the sl for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So to close out our chapter, Saul's plan has totally backfired. David is not only alive, but he is more popular than ever, and he is closer to the Lord than ever. 
But Saul isn't finished. And he will use more manipulation, more cunning, and more violence to attack David. Now, earlier I mentioned David's wise behavior. That wise behavior and and his high esteem were both closely connected to his humble heart. The same is true in a far greater sense of the, the son of David, that is Jesus Christ. Philippians 2 9 says of Jesus, Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. Why was it that the name of Jesus became highly esteemed? Well, verses 5 through 8 of Philippians 2 says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. That mind, that heart was in David. That mind, that heart is in Jesus. And God wants that mind and that heart to be in each of us. Let's close there and pray. Lord, again, we thank you for this time in your word. We thank you that your word does not return void. Lord, I pray that this word this evening would Remind us that you are faithful and that you will see us through the difficulties that we face in life. Lord, I pray that you would equip us with Humility that causes us to serve others and to place you first in our lives. Create in us pure hearts. Give us a desire to serve you to love one another. And to even love our enemies. Lord, we thank you for this evening as we depart here and at home or wherever we're headed after this, Lord. Just I pray your protection on each one of us, Lord. I also pray that you would give us opportunity, opportunities to share your love, to share your word with others. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.